The 17 most inspiring words of the 20th century uh, were spoken, or American 20th century history, were spoken by John F. Kennedy um, around midday on January 20th in 1961 in Washington, D.C. on the occasion of his presidential inauguration. And as he was about coming to the conclusion of his, his address, he had just declared that the torch was passed from a new to a new generation of Americans, to young, young people specifically. And he said, those who are born in this century, tempered by war, disciplined by hard and bitter peace, and proud of our ancient heritage. And then they were pledged, he said, to pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe, in order to assure the survival and success of liberty. And then he spoke the 17 most famous words that we all know, and that is, and so my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. And those were, words were positively electrifying for the, that generation. No president ha, up until this point had ever challenged its citizens during peacetime to sacrifice and to commit to a larger vision. And with this single sentence here, Kennedy, uh, in, inspire people to new possibilities. And so he raised their expectations of themselves and give, gave them a new vision of seeing themselves as citizens of the United States. And in response, thousands joined the Peace Corps, the Green Berets, they flocked to the Washington, D.C. They went to college with a new vision, not to work for themselves, but to work for uh, uh, into government service and into social causes. And all across the country, Kennedy's words changed lives and for a time redefined what it meant to be a citizen of the United States. So today we're gonna to continue in our study of, of chapter 10 of the Gospel of Mark. And we're gonna hear in today's section, Jesus redefine what it means to be his follower. And kind of in line with Kennedy's quote here, we need to rethink about how we look at the kingdom of God. And the statement for us should be, so my fellow disciples, ask not what your God can do for you, ask what you can do for your God. Now, how many of us really have this attitude in mind? God, what do you want me to do for you? I mean, most of us read books, we go to classes, we uh, memorize verses, look up passages, not so we can better give ourselves to the Lord, but most of the time we're thinking about what I can do to get him to do what I want him to do. And when he, that doesn't work, we get all mad at him and we turn our backs and uh, because he's too slow or he said no or he's not on my agenda or whatever it is, and uh, we don't get what we want, so we get all upset. Uh, but that shouldn't be how we as disciples of Jesus think at all. God has given us his son to take away our sins. He's given, filled us with the Holy Spirit. He has promised to meet our needs. He's promised to be with us forever and ever and never leave us or forsake us. And so our grateful hearts ought to respond differently instead of trying to get him to do what we want him to do. And uh, we ought to turn our, our, our heads around, just like Kennedy's speech inspired that new generation of people. We ought to be inspired to do, say, God, whatever you want me to do. I'm off my agenda, and I'm on to what you want me to do. And like Kennedy said before these words, we need to be willing to pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe, in order to assure the furtherance of his kingdom. That ought to be our attitude. And what I want to do is use this idea from this speech as the framework as we go through the passage today. And I'm going to give us points today and uh, frame them in the way of a few ask not statements. And again, as we've seen so many times in the gospel up until this point, the disciples have a persistent failure in understanding what Jesus was talking about. I mean, he, even, uh, um, you know, even though some of what these guys said and did, you know, we just want to shake our heads and go, really? <laughs> really? Is that, I mean, aren't y'all onto the plan of what he's saying by now? Aren't you paying attention? But, the, uh, but we don't need to stand, our, stand back and shake our heads at them or throw a rock at them and say, well, if it had been me. Because truth is, we are all them. I mean, we, uh, you know, we miss obvious stuff, don't we? 
We ask wrong questions. We come up being very faithless. We lack understanding and we head off on all kinds of tangents, all kinds of wrong places when the things are written down for us. We have the Holy Spirit residing in us. So we got to realize that we need to learn from their mistakes, just like their example. So we're jogging into what we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, let's, uh, the last thing the disciples have heard Jesus say last week from the interaction with the rich young ruler is, but many who are first will be last and the last will be first. And the implication here is that the kingdom of God is completely opposite of the way the world thinks, right? And he has reiterated this over and over and over to the gospel all in the gospel all the way up to chapter 10. But for them, in real time, it hadn't stuck so well. I mean, we're going to see this in this section that they just didn't, you know, they weren't up to speed on what's going on here. So verse 32 tells us that they're traveling uh, again. They're on their way to Jerusalem. And uh, uh, it says here that as Jesus was leading the way, the disciples were astonished. Well, those who were followed were afraid. Now, it doesn't tell us why the disciples were astonished and the crowds were afraid, but we can do surmising, some surmising here. And it's probably because the hostility and the resistance and the plotting that the Pharisees have done all along. And uh, remember that this is about two and a half years into Jesus' ministry. In fact, when we end chapter 10, chapter 11, brings us up to the last week of Jesus' ministry life. And so um, if you remember back to the fall, Jesus had gone away from the Jewish crowds way, uh, way back and he gone into the area of Tyre and Sidon where he met the Canaanite woman and he fed the 4,000. Then he came and came, left the Gentile area, came back to the Jewish lands in the middle of chapter 8. And so they're back in Jewish country now, but they haven't been back to Jerusalem at this point. They had been in the city of Bethsaida and Capernaum, but now here we have Jesus out in front, leading the way back to Jerusalem, knowing exactly what was waiting for them uh, as far as opposition was concerned. And so this is kind of unusual, right? I mean, usually when we know we're going to have opposition, we don't run toward it, do we? We drag our feet and we come up with excuses why we don't have to deal with that. And uh, we come up with all kinds of reasons why we don't need to to handle that. Jesus isn't that way. I mean, he knows that time is close for him to do what was been laid out from the foundation of the world. And, and uh, so uh, maybe the disciples have been amazed with the determination of Jesus, that he is just resolutely headed toward Jerusalem, despite what um, is lies ahead. Now, maybe they're a little afraid of that because of opposition with Jesus also means opposition with them though they can't possibly have any idea what really is lying ahead in just a few weeks ahead. So Jesus stops. You know, he's on his way, but he stopped. He pulls the 12 aside and told them what was going to happen to him. Now, uh, this is the third time in the Gospel of Mark that Jesus is laying out exactly what's going to happen. And this, in this section, he is the most clear about what's coming for them. And he says, we're going to Jerusalem. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed. And they're going to condemn him to death and hand him over to the Gentiles. And so all the plotting of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, it's going to succeed is what he's saying. He's saying they're going to be successful at Betray, uh, turning me over to the Gentiles, that's because we know that the, the Jews didn't have the right to uh, execute anybody. So that means that he's going to turn them over to Rome, who are going to mock him, spit on him, flog him, and then kill him. This is the normal uh, 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 way things would happen in, in, in execution in Rome. And so... And then he says three days later he's going to rise. Now, Luke chapter 18 tells us that the disciples didn't get any of this. They were completely baffled by what was going on. Maybe it's because they still had such a strong preconception about what Messiah would be. Or, or maybe they didn't have any understanding of this because there's no way they could understand it without the presence of the Holy Spirit. But they did not have until Pentecost. Maybe it's both. But... What happens next here in Mark makes it pretty obvious that they didn't know what was going on. And they, uh, so Jesus just finished with this private moment with the 12. No doubt had a lot of emotion about explaining this. I mean, you just don't tell. He knew what was happening. 
you knew what was going to happen, and you don't talk about something about uh, betrayal and torture and death like you're talking about the weather forecast. So he no doubt had a lot of emotion when he was telling them. Um, but instead of a follow-up question from anybody like, hey, can you explain that whole rising part? Or, wait, what? Now, can, do you sure you want to go there? I mean, there was no, we don't have any indication that they asked any follow-up questions like that. But what we do have is the next verse is James and John, which uh, they came to him after this, right on the heels of this, and said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Now, as a mom... If that was posed to me in that, in that form, I would be way less likely to grant this request. I mean, I mean it's like, Jesus, um, we have this blank check for he, you here. I mean, could you sign your name at the bottom of that? We're not going to tell you what we really want. We just want you to tell us you're going to do it, right? I mean, for me, yeah, that's not happening. <laughs> Sorry, kids. No. Uh, so, But Jesus, he doesn't do that. He doesn't rebuke them. He gets right to the point and he says, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus asks. And then they reply, he, they say, let one of us sit at your right and the other at left in glory. Now, here in the NIV, it says let as if it's a, a, just a normal request, but the better translation here, it's not let, it's grant. And so it's a stronger uh, thing, almost like it's a demand. Grant us, let us do this, Jesus, kind of, kind of attitude. Now, Matthew's version of this, tells us that their mom was involved. So we don't know if it was her idea or their idea or they cooked this up together, but regardless, they latch onto the idea enough to take it to Jesus. This is pretty presumptuous of them. Uh, it, now, it might not have been that they were thinking that they want to sit on the left and right of Jesus in his eternal glory. Um, could have been. They were at the transfiguration. They saw Jesus glorified, so they knew who he was there, but they might have still been holding on to the idea, uh, the popular idea of Jews that the Messiah would come in, throw off Rome, set up an earthly kingdom, and take the throne of David and, and, and fulfill that prophecy. And But what, what they were, did mean, regardless of which one of those they, they meant, is they wanted a seat of prominence. To be on the right hand of the king was the number one position to be on the left was the number two position. James and John wanted to have a place of prominence in God, in Christ's uh, uh, reign. And um, they wanted a seat at the ruling council. And it wasn't enough for them to be part of Jesus' closest 12 or even part of the inner circle like they were with Peter who were uh, taken by Jesus to do special things. That wasn't enough for them. Uh, they have gotten together now, and like an episode of Survivor, they have voted the other ten off the island. And, and so Jesus, in his humanity, must have been stunned. Like, really? <laughs> I mean, this is what... Didn't you hear anything that I just said about suffering, about dying, and about rising? And this is what you come up with? Um, and you are talking about wanting power and influence and prominence? Now, this... Interaction with James and John is the context for what Jesus gives us for redefining for us what it means to be his follower. And so we want, uh, this is a warning to us as believers today, too. So I ask my first uh, point is that we need to ask not for a seat. So I'm going to put these all in ask not form. So ask not for a seat. And by that, mean he, what I mean here is that there's only one seat in glory. And that's for Jesus. I mean, he is king of kings. He is Lord of lords. He does not share his power or his glory or his honor with anybody. It is all about him. And this Revelation 5, if you read that whole chapter there, uh, you will see a vivid description of the Lamb of God standing at the center of the throne, encircled by all of the redeemed, by all of the angels, joined by every creature in heaven, every creature on earth, under earth, in the sea, all, everything created is worshiping the Lamb. And they sing here, verse 13, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. All of creation is oriented toward the praise and worship of the only Lord, the only ruler, the only majestic one. And while we can kind of laugh at James and John, and with their pridefulness and their overconfidence, we're the same. We are the same. We start out with right heart and right focus. And
and but let something not go our way or someone get something we thought we should have or someone not notice our hard work and suddenly we don't care too much about Jesus at all uh, we, we are going did you see what she did to me did you see how they overlooked me we are not worried about him we are worried about me I read this blog about four or five years ago and it was called it was written by this uh, writer, Garrett Kell. Now, I don't know anything about him, where he comes from, but it was called Stop Photobombing Jesus. And the concept stuck with me. And now, you know what a photobomb is, right? Here's a really good example of it. This is me and my, oh, my son, Jason, and my other son, Ryan. This is a photobomb. That is stick your head out from behind the main picture to draw attention to yourself. And that's exactly what this is a picture of. So you're trying to spoil the photograph by appearing in the background to draw attention away. And the point is that we're attracting, it's attracting away from the main subject. And that's what we have to be careful with as followers of Jesus. If we are concerned about where we sit, who sees us, getting credit, uh, we are like, just like my oldest son, sticking our head out from behind Jesus to try to attract attention toward ourselves, just like a photobomb. And I like this quote from, from, this, from this blog. It says, the desire for God to be glorified through me is the height of my created purpose. But there is a fine line between wanting God to use me for his glory and wanting everyone to know it. It is the fine line between pure worship and idolatry. So let that sink in for a little bit. So we have to be really careful, really careful to check our motives and our desires when we start asking for a place in the spotlight. He is the center, always. So we need to not ask for a seat. He has the seat, and he is the one who is glorified and worshiped. So uh, the next point is that we need to ask not in overconfidence, and this leads us to verse 38. He, uh, Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? Now, the cup and baptism here, he was using metaphorically and, 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 and relating to suffering. Now, there are, three other, there are three other places in the Gospels where this gives a better understanding of that. And that's in Matthew and Luke. It's talking about in the Garden of Gethsemane where he's asking for the cup to be removed from him, talking about the coming crucifixion. And in John 8, he refers when Peter is trying to stop Jesus from being arrested, taking him toward the cup, the, the suffering that's coming with the cross. Again, so that's what it's talking about there. And so to be baptized into it is to be plunged into the suffering completely that he is going to to endure on the cross. And so uh, uh, Jesus at, uh, asked them that, and James and John, once again, in overconfidence, say, we can, we can do this. Now, the original language of this means it's not, not two words, it's one word, which means we are powerful. Now, I think uh, partly he's, they probably said that as a statement of loyalty and uh and, and that they are determined to follow Jesus no matter what. They didn't understand what they were saying. Uh, it was partly overconfidence because they, they really didn't know what was coming, what was about to happen, or that in just a few weeks they would all run away from Jesus, be hiding out in a room somewhere, afraid for their lives. But they can keep going, what Jesus says here. He predicts that they will have courage. He says, you're going to be able to drink the cup I drink and be baptized eventually. And, but where you sit is not for me to decide. And so, but if you look at history, James is the first martyr of the church. And that's recorded in Acts chapter 12. John lives his life out, lives to almost 90 years old, uh, dying on the island of Patmos. That does not mean he was sitting on a beach enjoying it up there. In fact, he endured a lot of suffering as well. In fact, they tried to kill him by boiling him in oil, but he did not die, and they didn't know what to do with that. So they're like, I don't know. We can't kill him. We're going to just send him over for hard labor on the Isle of Patmos, and that's where he died. Um, so these two brothers were going to suffer, but their boldness and willing to suffer for Jesus will come after the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. After the death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ, 
then they will be bold. Then they will stand up. But right now, at this moment, they're a little overconfident. So we have to be that careful at that careful about that as well because the truth is when we ask God for things, sometimes we can have a little bit of overconfidence too as if we know exactly what's going on in front of us and that we have understanding uh, but because, you know, like I've said before, half the time when we pray, we spend telling God what the problem is. You know, Aunt Martha, she's got a spot on her liver and we're worried about it and it happened up overnight. And, you know, all these things that we explain to God what happened as if he needs our, our input there. And then the rest of the time, what we do is we tell him what to do about it. We're like, now we would just want this to be taken care of and we just want it to go away. And if you could just do this, you know, so she won't be afraid anymore or whatever. And we just tell him how to handle the situation. But, uh, you know, we don't ever need to think we have all the information about what's going on in a situation. I mean, we're worried about Aunt Martha, but God knows that this situation, he has bigger things in mind. For example, he needs to see the faith and trust of Aunt Martha. Uh, you know, she needs to walk in that to be an impact on the lady at the front desk at the doctor's office. Or that she needs, she, her own faith needs to be stirred up to trust God in this situation. Or for the uh, encouragement of Uncle Jack or Cousin Mary or whoever of any of the 25 or 250 or 2,000 different things that God has going on in a situation. We have to be careful to think we don't, we know what's best because we don't. We have limited vision. Now, it's presumptuous of, of us to think we do know what's going on. Now, we can certainly have a pre preferred outcome in things. There's nothing wrong with that, nothing wrong with praying those things. But we also need to learn to pray elevated prayers. We need to pray kingdom-oriented prayers that have the, the mindset and the vision of what God tells us isn't most important. And if you read the prayers of the New Testament, you'll see that Paul and the other writers rarely spend time talking about in their prayers the things that populate and occupy most of what we say. Their prayers are not focused on temporary things of this world. They are lifted up. And Jesus' pattern prayer for us, when the disciples say, teach us how to pray, he says, pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Now, how is God's will done on earth as it is in heaven? It's done fully and completely all the way through. That's what he's saying for us to pray. So when someone asks prayer for us, our first question, the very first question we always need to ask is, is that person a Christian? Are they a believer? Because if they are not a believer, your prayers ought to be different. It ought to be, God, use this relationship thing, this job thing, this health thing, whatever's going on, to drive them to you. Drive them to the feet of Jesus because first, that is the first and foremost and most important thing you pray for somebody who's not a believer. Because who cares if they are healthy, wealthy, and, and, and fine if their soul is in peril. We need to understand that that is the most important thing. And if they are Christians, our prayers ought to be different as well. Lord, build them up so that they are strong in their faith, so they are resolute in their commitment, so that you, uh, so that through them, others can see you. And so they, their commitment to you ought to shine through the darkness like the light. God, transform this trouble into a bridge to your kingdom. That's how you pray. And that's what's, what we do when we pray kingdom-centered prayers. There is nothing wrong with praying for the needs of people around you. But that's not where we should stop, which is earthly Concerns. Jesus and his kingdom ought to be at the center of what we pray. And when that is our focus, then you know what? We can have confidence. Not self-confidence or not overconfidence, but godly confidence, right? And that's what we get in Hebrews 14. Then we can boldly approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we can receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. You know what? Uh, getting mercy and grace when we pray, that is a huge gift that we often don't value correctly. 
You know, this is what he promised. Every time you pray, he's going to get mercy, and you're going to get grace, and you're going to get his help. Doesn't mean we get the answers that we want, but those are wonderful gifts every time we come into the throne of God. So uh, the other disciples, back to our story, the other disciples hear about what James and John said to Jesus, and not surprisingly, they are indignant. <laughs> this is They were just mad. Not because James and John were missing the point of what was going on here. It's likely because they thought that they were taking advantage and had, had pulled Jesus off to the side to use the relationship with him to try to garner a little extra favor. I mean, this is just plain old envy and jealousy going on here. And they were mad because James and John had outmaneuvered them. And so Jesus, here for, it brings us up to our last point, he addresses this self-promoting mindset and, he tell, and this is where we got need to know that we don't need to ask for another model. We don't need to ask for another model. And that's verse 42. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. And so Jesus pointed to the model followed by the world, uh, and that's one that where, they, where authority and powers is sought after and grabbed. And that look out for number one, you do to you, don't worry about anybody else kind of idea is alive and well today, just like it was back then. And we see in this passage that uh, this isn't a problem just for unbelievers, right? We have it in us all the time as believers to say, well, what about me? What about me? Just like the disciples said, this desire for ambition, having overconfidence, and competition fueled by this desire for self-promotion is something we really have to work hard to be vigilant against. I mean, the flesh is strong, right? It wants to be out front. It wants to be first. It wants to be noticed. We have that all within us. So here's what Jesus says. He says, not so with you. Don't be like that. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Now, first of all, notice that he does not condemn the desire for greatness or ambition. He doesn't. What he does correct is how to go about it and their mindset, which focused on themselves instead of the kingdom of God. Uh, so it's not about what I get for myself. It's about what I can give to God by giving to others. And he says, that's right. And so this is a complete realignment of thinking. The more I can direct the tension off of me onto Christ, then the more joy that should give us as disciples. And then he says, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. And the word slave, like we heard Connie say at the beginning, is the word doulos. And this is uh, one who sells himself into slavery to another, indicating a disregard for personal needs or the better, for, for the betterment of his master. So the English really doesn't give us a good understanding of this definition right here. It doesn't mean a free person who volunteers to help somebody else or even a hired hand kind of idea. And uh, it's easier for us in, here in the West to not to understand what this is about, to not think of the modern understanding of what slavery is. That is forced servitude under a master. That's not at all what this is talking about. Jesus is saying it's more like a mother's devotion to a child. I mean, you think about a mom and a child. For years and years and years and years, moms devote themselves to serving their kids, right? I mean, it's all encompassing, especially in those early years. I mean, you give up everything, right? Time, money, sleep, uh, personal pursuits, physical comforts. You know, it's like, you know, you grow up and get to be an adult, and you realize, you know what, mom really didn't want the smallest piece of pie, right? <laughs> mom didn't really want to eat the broccoli stems, right? She's taking less and giving the children what they want. I, you know, I remember one Saturday, uh, a few, three or four years ago, Ryan, my photobombing son, <laughs> um, he is an adult now, he was probably about 26, 25, 26 at the time, and he called us up on one Saturday morning, he's like, I have to move today. And I'm like, what? You have to move today? And so we knew it was coming because he was supposed to run out. His lease was supposed to run out at the end of the month, but we thought he was going to, you know, because it wasn't working right that he was going to pay another month and just take his time. But he decided on the last day of the month, I need to move today. 
And so there was nobody else available. So what did we do on Saturday morning? We set aside all of our plans. 10 o'clock, we load up the, the pickup truck and full-size trailer, and we drive off to Roswell. And we spend the day loading up every single thing that Ryan owned. I mean, and he has a pickup truck too, and so we spent all day packing boxes, putting them on the stuff, and then loading them all up on these two trucks in the trailer and going through Roswell like Beverly Hillbillies. with stuff piled up to the sky, and we were so tired. And we, after just packing it up, we then got there, unpacked, set up his bedroom, set up his kitchen, did all of this stuff. We, it was two in the morning until we got home. We were exhausted. It was such a hard day, but you know, we do it again, right? If he calls and says, I need to move, we pack up and we go. We did it voluntarily, and that's the picture, that it is, but Jesus helps us change our views. You're not just doing this for your kids or your friends or people in your family. He says, you do it for all. And this is a realignment of how we think, right? It's like, it's not too much to ask to serve whoever comes across your path. And then lastly, he finishes this up here. He says in verse 45, for even the son of man did not come to serve, to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And now this is the summary statement of Mark's letter, which came, contains the clearest statement of the objective of Christ's come, coming found in all of the gospels. A one-sentence summary of what Jesus did. Now, but it's really important to notice that this theological declaration here was made to enforce a practical truth for everyday living. So he didn't just come here. He says, this is how you live. Not to be served, but to serve. And give your life if necessary. Jesus came voluntarily of his own free will to show us the principle of service here. Now, he didn't just give the disciples or us a lecture on what to do and say, now go off and do it. But with determination on his way to Jerusalem, knowing what was coming there, he is going to show them in the most graphic and unmistakable way what servant leadership looked like. And he would literally give himself as a ransom for many. And his life will culminate in his sacrificial death as the highest and clearest demonstration of servant leadership. The disciples learned an important lesson about Jesus, about what God truly values. They learned that a consistent, sincere lifestyle of putting other people first while placing their own desires behind and put him on hold for the benefit of the kingdom of God is the pathway to true greatness and what it means to be a servant of God. And history tells us they did not stay with this self-focused mindset. They sacrificed everything, even their lives, for the kingdom of God in the book of Acts. No price was too big to pay when they understand who Jesus was and what he had done for them. And for us to be truly his disciples, ask not for another path. Amen? God, we just thank you for such a vivid demonstration of what it means to be your follower. And a reminder that even when we get off track, even when we think the wrong things, even when we get uh, off direction, that you can bring us back around and point us toward your example of giving your life for us. God, let us not be so focused on now and ourselves, but to remember that we're here for a bigger reason. We are here to proclaim the kingdom of God has come and to elevate you as the one who sits on the throne, the eternal son of God who rules and reigns over all things. We thank you. We pray that the Holy Spirit would empower us to do this every single day, not on Sundays, not just uh, in theory, but in practicality, to serve those who don't want us to serve them, who don't like us, who are mean to us. God, just give us the willingness to sacrifice everything 
uh, for your kingdom. For it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.